most government agencies are laundromats for our tax dollars. We send money to them, they launder it through the bureaucracy, and they send it back to us, and we're supposed to feel good about that. Today we got two special guests. We have Scott Hodge, who is President Emeritus and Senior Policy Advisor at the Tax Foundation. Scott was one of the driving forces behind tax reform in 2017 that resulted in the historic Tax Cut and Jobs Act under President Trump's first administration. And our second guest is our former co-host, Kai Prima, who is co-hosting once again after a year and a half. I'm not even sure if she knows what's going on. So uh, (laughs) welcome to both Kai and Scott. Hey, Jesse. Great to be with you. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Trump just recently had an an election that he won, and he said that he's going to create the Doge Department or the Department of Government Efficiency, and it's going to have Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy. And I was listening to an interview with Vivek where he says that they think they can cut over $2 trillion dollars out of the federal budget. And then when you're looking at the total federal budget, depending on the year, but it's somewhere around like six and a half trillion dollars. So you're essentially talking about one third of the budget. Uh, And, you know, I mean, Elon Musk, I mean, he cut 80% of the budget at Twitter, right? So, I mean, maybe is he going to Twitterify the whole U.S. government? I mean, what's what's going to happen, Scott? Yeah, yeah, he's going to, yeah, he's going to carry a sink into every government agency. And I guess, flush out the dead wood, he faces a huge challenge. And the math, uh, the ambitions are great. And I love hearing about it because I've been studying uh, government waste and inefficiency and, and the size of government for 35 years. And I've been frustrated by the continued growth of the federal government, the amount of waste that's there, the programs that have lived well beyond their their relevancy and original missions, uh, the amount of duplication, all of these things are a big challenge. The math, however, is very challenging. And as you mentioned, their goal is to cut about one third of the budget out. That's hard to do because let's look at the math. Out of that roughly six and a half trillion dollars worth of annual spending, the first trillion and a half is Social Security. The second trillion is Medicare. And then Medicaid comes in at about 600 billion. So now we're looking with some of the other entitlement programs at about $4 trillion uh, that are very sensitive programs that are going to be hard to sort of, you know, wrestle some reforms. And then interest on the national debt is about another trillion dollars. So now we're looking at $5 trillion out of six and a half. So what are we left with? You know, defense is another almost a trillion dollars. And so not to say that there's not efficiencies there, there are. But again, that's an area in which many people think we ought to increase spending or rearrange spending. And that leaves you the domestic side of the budget, which is everything from congressional salaries, which ought to be cut, to, you know, Department of Education, Transportation, Labor, Housing, Urban Development, HHS, and all these other things. So the math is a big challenge. And I know I've gone through this exercise a couple of times in my career uh, in the safety of my white ivory tower think tank office, but it's a it's a big challenge. It's not to say that there isn't a tremendous amount of waste and duplication, redundancy, um, programs that, that really don't belong there anymore. But again, it's a, the math makes this a, a really big challenge. And then the politics of it. You know, behind every one of those programs that you and I will never encounter in our lives, is a constituency that will just scream and yell if any dollar of their budget gets gets cut. So that too, uh, beyond the math, makes this a huge, huge challenge. And however, I welcome it. I think this is a great thing that they should be doing. Previous efforts uh, along this lines have been mixed. You know, during the 1940s, uh, former, uh, then former President Herbert Hoover Uh, led a reform project and was quite successful in rearranging some of the deck chairs of government. He led a second effort in the 1950s, eh, 
not so successful. Ronald Reagan had his Grace Commission, which produced, I don't know, 2,000 different recommendations that were never uh, uh, enacted because Congress didn't do anything with it. Similarly, we saw during Bill Clinton's um, administration, the Reinventing Government Program led by Al Gore. That spent more time asking how government should do things rather than what government should do. And so it didn't have much of a lasting effort. So again, these these kind of projects can either just be boutique exercises or they can be substantive. And it really, a lot of it will depend on whether Congress plays along. If you were to advise Elon, what are some of the sort of inefficiencies that you've studied that you would tell them, hey, in the defense budget, in the defense spend, this is our inefficiencies. What are some of those specific things you think that you would tell them to to get started, to start cutting out? I would treat the federal government as if it's a failing business that's been put in receivership. And you have to go into it with a real dispassionate view. So the first thing you do is I would look at any program that's over 100 years old. Okay. That was created during a time that no longer exists. You know, anything really that was started during the Depression or beyond. And you can start looking at things like the Export-Import Bank, which was created during the 1930s to facilitate exports and trade with Russia. <laughs> and now it's just basically a, a big uh, a bank for Boeing and others that sell overseas. Cut that one out. The Rural Electrification Administration, again, created during the Depression to bring electricity to rural America. That can go. And then you've got all kinds of programs. Uh, I would call them businesses that the government runs. You know, things like the Tennessee Valley Authority, again, created during the Great Depression. Why is the U.S. government running an electric utility? The same thing we have the Power and Market Administrations out west. Uh, they're the same sort of thing as the TBA. Why is the government running an electric company out west? Privatize those. Um, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Big Bird. <laughs> well, you know, we all have about 300 channels on cable and plus all the things that we can do on our phone. We don't need a publicly financed television station. So those are the kind of things that I would do to start with. And then you look at redundancy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, name, name them all. And how much do you think we're going to spend? I mean, uh, how much do you think we'll save once we start cutting these things? Well, it's, sometimes it's not a lot, frankly, and it's more symbolic. But I, you know, I look back a number of years ago, um, Southwest Airlines released a press release saying that they were no longer going to serve lemons with their drinks on, okay. on board. And you say, well, why, why would you do that? Well, what they were trying to do was send a signal that by cutting back on things like lemons on, in your drinks, this is how they were going to save their customers money and make their more affordable you know, ticket prices. And that's what a lot of what we're going to have to do in government. Start cutting these little things so that you're sending the signal to both taxpayers and the bureaucracy that we're not going to put up with this anymore. So, for instance, the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, did a study a few years ago, and they found that there were uh, well, it's in 80 economic development agencies or programs, 100 surface transportation programs, and 44 employment and trading programs. And now that either tells us that one of them or many of them are not successful and we needed more, or else they just kind of spring up like mushrooms over time as we build in this redundancy across government. And we ought to look very seriously at that kind of consolidation, uh, getting rid of all of these programs. If, if you need more than one, <laughs> then it ought to tell us it's not working. Um, there was, in fact, it was kind of a funny story a number of years ago where GAO looked at these redundancy and employment and training programs Half of the programs didn't know how many people they were training, and the other half of the programs knew how many people they trained. They just didn't know, didn't know if they got jobs after they'd been trained. And so this is government efficiency at work. I always like Elon Musk's quote where he's like, if you want to know what government, what government looks like, it's the DMV at scale. 
which is I think yeah. one of his one of my favorite lines. The DMV at scale is government bureaucracy, basically. And Scott, since I opened up this first question, I'm talking about how Vivek Ramaswamy said they were going to save two trillion dollars. What is an actual realistic amount? And then secondly, I was kind of looking at trying to find out how many government agencies, commissions, departments there were. And it says that experts don't even know. It says that they ex- estimate that there's over 2,000 federal government agencies, commissions, and departments. And yeah. like, I mean, the fact is, if we have 2,000 plus and they can't even make a count, if you if you don't know how many of these things we have, we probably have too, too many. So the question is to you that you've studied this, how many of these government agencies, commissions, and departments at the federal level do we have? And how much money can they actually save? Like, I think two trillions, like you said, they're not cutting out a third. That's not realistic, right? But how much can they actually cut out? Yeah, well, official cabinet agencies are around a dozen to 15, uh, depending on how you define them. But then within all of those cabinet agencies, you have lots of independent agencies or, or bureaus, and then if you, depending on how you, you do uh, count them, there are well over 440 uh, specific agencies and departments in government. And then perhaps even at a smaller level, you get into that 2000 range. And so, yes, uh, it, a lot, we don't know how many there are because they, they proliferate. And, um, and, that, and that's why you really are going to have to get in with... Um, uh, you know, surgical tools to dig these things out and, and to ferret them out. Um, and, and again, getting back to so many of these programs have been created over decades and generations that you have what I call sort of sedimentary deposits of government, one built on the next. And we really need to start going back to the beginning and say, gosh, you know, these things that were created during the Depression or World War I, do we still need them anymore? And I would say the answer is no, that, you know, you've got to look at the times in which these things may have been created to solve a problem that no longer exists. And yet they find ways of reinventing themselves uh, in order to stay relevant and to stay uh, funding. One of my great, my, my favorite studies or stories about this uh, and how government agencies can reinvent themselves is the National Fertilizer and Development and Economic Development Center in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, which was originally built as a munitions factory during World War I. And yet, it was not finished in time for the war effort. So they said, well, what do we do with this? And apparently making fertilizer is very similar to making munitions. It's the same kind of process, the same kind of stuff. Well, for years it made fertilizer and then gave it away to farmers in the Tennessee Valley area. Well, then it produced it in the process of doing that. It so soiled the area around the, the, uh, the, the factory that they had to reinvent themselves to be environmentally friendly. And that's why they changed their name to the National Fertilizer and Environmental Development Research Center. So this is how government agencies work. They, they're constantly finding new ways in order to, to make themselves relevant and worthy of more funding. What do you think they do all day now? Is it, <laughs> what do they actually, so they go to work and then, <laughs> what do they do I, I, all day? Sure. Whatever they do, I'm sure that it has to do with climate change because every government agency is getting into the business of, of being relevant to climate change. And this is how, they, how things uh, uh, go. And whatever the new thing is, that this, whatever administration comes in, they're going to reinvent themselves in order to be relevant and worthy of funding. This is how it goes. How much do you think we allocate for climate change projects um, oh, out of our great, budget? Is is that why question. we're is that why everybody wants to be climate change friendly, even though we know there's no science? I'm just going to say it. Yeah. But I how, how much money goes in that, and would then would then uh, would Trump's administration would then sort of start cutting back on that? Uh, so then we reallocate funds to things that we really do need, like whether it's defense or whatever it is. Yeah, the climate change area has become a real boondoggle. And, you know, serious funding for both corporate welfare, 
people in the nonprofit world are getting tens of billions of dollars uh, in funding and grants from places like the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Energy, and so forth. The badly named Inflation Reduction Act has, you know, allocated probably a trillion dollars over the next decade for this kind of stuff. And when you start looking at where these grants are going, they're going to all of these little nonprofits that are out there, you know, working in communities or advocating, basically shock troops for the left. And, you know, it's a complete waste of money. But these groups are there now to agitate on behalf of climate change. So the government is funding these groups in order to be, you know, basically sock puppets to, to talk about climate change. And that has got to go. We've got to stop funding extremist groups or, or any sorts of nonprofits that have their own agenda. And part of that agenda is, is, is lobbying for more money. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, but that's, that's a lot how it works. I agree. Do you think they would be successful in sort of, I mean, I guess let's go towards the nonprofit, you know, conversation. So much spend goes to these nonprofits that it's almost like, you know, let's everybody like I feel like everyone's starting a nonprofit because it's it's like the I, I, I almost like want to call it a scam. Is that like kind of out there? Well, uh, there's so on. many there's so many nonprofit scams. And then I feel like we also need to clean sort of that nonprofit sector, I feel, whether it's on the homelessness nonprofits or climate or I feel like everybody can just easily start an organization with the hopes of trying to get government money and they're mm -hmm. getting these grants. Would the Doge team, you think, will be successful in being able to kind of stop the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it kind of stopped the frivolous funding of these organizations. And how can they do that? Do they need Congress to approve that? Like, yeah. where do they begin? Yeah, one of the unfortunate aspects of this kind of a project is that it's independent of government. So it really has no legislative authority to do anything on its own. So they can come up with the greatest ideas in the world on how to downsize the size of government. But unless Congress takes that up, and, and puts that into legislation and sends that to the president for his signature, it's kind of a wasted effort. We've seen these kinds of things before. It was either the Bush administration or the Obama administration had a similar kind of um, blue ribbon panel in which they bring people from both sides, you know, mainly retired members of Congress, together from both sides of the aisle to work up ideas to reduce the deficit. They can come up with, you know, basically stacks of recommendations. And unless Congress does some, something about it, those ideas just sit on a dusty shelf. And we've seen too much of that over the years. In fact, I've produced some of those books that are sitting on a dusty shelf. And it's really unfortunate when you look back and say, gee, the recommendations I made in the book 30 years ago are still relevant today. And that's, that gets kind of depressing. But we got to keep trying. And and one of the things that's never done is to communicate to average taxpayers how this will benefit them. And this gets to a point I think you were trying to get to earlier. And that is, you know, most of us really have no idea what government does or the benefits that we get. Oh, yeah. OK, we'll get a check for Social Security or something else. We on the roads, but we really don't know what the value of those things are. Most government agencies are laundromats for our tax dollars. We send money to them, they launder it through the bureaucracy, and they send it back to us, and we're supposed to feel good about that. Well, there's a lot of waste in that. <laughs> so let's, you know, let's start thinking about how we can shift, for instance, education spending back to the states where it really belongs rather than being laundered through the bureaucracy in Washington, only to sent, be sent back to the states. Same thing with transportation. I mean, the roads generally are the kind of things that state and local governments do. Cut out the middleman, send the money back to the states. Those are the kind of things that I think would be helpful in giving people the sense like, oh, okay, we're taking back responsibility for all of these programs to the local level or the state level where we can have more authority. 
But also, I think the other thing that we need to do that I think would get to your point is use much of the savings or some of the savings from cutting government to cut taxes. Yes, we want to use some of the savings or a lot of it for deficit reduction because that's now huge. But we want to give some of that back in tax reductions so that people feel like they got some benefit from a smaller government. And I think that that would go a long way in the help to marketing of, of these kind of projects and efforts and, and give real taxpayers a stake in the outcome, which right now they, they wouldn't necessarily have. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I really like your ideas. Um, and, and I do feel that, that one of the things is, is that communication to the public and sort of if, if they were to just explain to us, like, we're doing this because it's going to do this, 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 that it will essentially benefit you. And I hope that uh, they'll implement more of that communication in this next administration. You should tell them to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's been one of the, one of the points that I've advocated for a long time is that taxpayers, taxpayers really have to be part of this this effort because they are the ones that ought to be ought to see the benefits directly and it, so it's not just an abstraction but it's a reality uh, an, another area that i think we ought to think uh, a lot about is starting to sell off a lot of government assets you know the government owns millions of acres of land and buildings and things like that why a lot of that could be sold off you could change you know like rangeland for instance why is the federal federal government uh, managing rangelands in, in in Colorado or Wyoming or so forth? Why shouldn't Colorado or Wyoming manage those? You know, so let's start thinking about what are truly federal responsibilities, and what are truly state and local responsibilities, and can't we shift some of those things from Washington back to the states where they they truly belong, or as I say, sell off some of that range land so it's put in private hands to be managed privately, which is often much more efficiently done than government. Yeah, Scott, right now the U.S. federal or national deficit is like $36 trillion. And I think in the 1990s and was it early 2000s under the uh, President Clinton administration, they you know balanced the budget, we had no deficit. But I was reading a, a book in preparation for this podcast that was saying, I believe in like nine, the early 1980s, Medicare, Medicaid was like 7% of the budget. And now Medicaid, Medicare is like 20% and really just kind of like these skyrocketing healthcare costs. And of course, now with Social Security, that's over 20% of the federal budget, especially now as we have more baby boomers, you know, a, a big cohort of individuals that are retired. Right now, there's something like 10 or 11,000 baby boomers retiring a day. The U.S. fertility rate has decreased, you know, back in the 1930s when FDR implemented Social Security. The I think we had 42 workers paying in versus one worker receiving. And the life expectancy at that time was in the 60s, right? Which meant that people, very few people would even collect on it. Now the re you can actually collect at 62, yet the life expectancy is closer to to 80. I mean, it's come down a little bit since COVID in 20, 2014, but... Look, you, you've hit on one of the essential problems here is that we have vast areas of the government that are growing faster than the economy. Um... Social Security, for instance, is growing at roughly 6% a year. Uh, Medicare is growing, what, 7 8% at least a year. The economy, at best, is growing 2 to 4% a year. That's unsustainable. You can't have programs that are, are essentially growing without stop so much faster than the overall economy that needs to be funding it. So we're going to have to find some way to slow the growth of those programs back to at least to a level that the economy and thus tax revenues can sustain. And that's really a serious, serious issue. Imagine if your mortgage was growing faster than your economy or than your income. That'd be impossible, right? Why even buy um, a house? Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't afford it. 
So that's the situation we're in right now. And so we're going to have to find ways. It, these are going to be the most politically challenging issues out there, and that is addressing the growth in Social Security and Medicare. Um, and a lot of it's de de demographics. <laughs> we, you just, if you don't have enough workers to fund these programs, uh, how is the financing going to work? And it's just not financially sustainable. Our population is declining. How do you reckon they can incentivize people to have more children? <laughs> well, I don't know if you can use the tax code or other things to encourage that. The other thing you can do is encourage more immigration. Um, you know, then and this effort to um, deport millions of people uh, is sort of counterproductive if you want a healthy growing economy to support an entitlement system that's growing faster than the economy. So, uh, you know, we need to think about these things in holistic terms and the unintended consequences of these policies. You get people that aren't a fan of Elon Musk taking, you know, kind of being part of this Doge, Doge, um, you know, commission, whatever. But the one point that I will admit that I think some of the critics have against him is just the conflicts of interest. He works with the the U.S. Space Force and NASA, uh, you know, like the EVs, his Tesla car company really took off because of all the the carbon credits and things like that and other, you know, quote unquote, yeah. green energy credits. So like the, Elon Musk is the richest person in the world, probably mostly due to government grants. So it's, I mean, one, you could say like, well, the guy works with the government, so maybe he knows where the inefficiencies are, but the conflicts of interest that this guy has is also, uh, you know, there's several conflicts of interest, I guess you could say with Elon Musk and the, the government, right? Yeah. I, I, gosh, I think that's an absolutely fair criticism. And he's in a symbiotic relationship with the federal government. On the other hand, if we want to look at the tax side of this issue, and how do we get more revenues? Well, we can start eliminating some of the tax breaks that have been created that benefit companies like Tesla or some of the other green energy things that are essentially becoming uh, corporate welfare. And I think that we could go a long way in closing some of these loopholes and tax breaks that benefit very, very select industries under the guise of sort of helping green energy, but have really just become uh, taxpayer boondoggles. And that would be a start. And interestingly enough, uh, before the uh, Inflation Reduction Act was uh, signed into law, uh, Tesla's company was no longer eligible for EV subsidies because the original EV subsidies put a, a, a cap on the number of autos that you could sell bef before you lost your subsidy. And they had exceeded that cap of 240,000 or something like that. And so at that time, uh, Teslas were no longer eligible for the tax credits, along with General Motors is the other one. And so why did we start that up again and make Teslas uh, eligible again for the EV credits. That didn't make any sense whatsoever. So why not go back to a time in which they were no longer eligible? Do you think they might go back to that again? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that um, Musk probably, in his heart of hearts, would want to get rid of those credits because they're actually benefiting his competitors now more than his own customers. And so, uh, you know, you think about who's really benefiting from the EV credits. So, well, it's, you know, companies like Ford with their Mustang and a lot of some of the, uh, the uh, foreign imports now, which are able to use them in some fashion. So I think he would probably be, you know, welcome getting rid of them. But we ought to look even broader at that. And, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act is now estimated cost taxpayers a trillion dollars over the next Good decade Lord. in all of these different subsidy programs. And so I think we had to look very carefully at, uh, seriously at, at, at eliminating that as a starter and, and, and start then looking through other areas of the tax code that are really benefiting big businesses and the rich uh, more than anyone else. Geez, I wonder how big the team needs to be to 
start really looking into these kind of because yep. they need obviously the think tanks like yourself to to really look at you know the hundred year old programs that just like gotta go gotta go and then put that in front of congress do you feel hopeful that you know they'll be successful in kind of c- cutting these kind of superfluous expenditure with having congress in the house do you think that will be a lot more successful than say when reagan tried it yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little worried. You know, when Musk went into Twitter, I mean, he just threw everything out, yes, uh, right. you know, the baby out with the bathwater and then realized, oh, I really do need some of these people after all. And I think that if you go in without a lot of knowledge, you can end up, uh, yes, you can successfully cut spending, but you can do so in a harmful way and not a, in a successful way. And when you do things like a bull in a china shop, you learn the you you lose the advantage of some of the public relations that might come from it, because all people are going to hear is about the pain, and they're not going to hear anything about the gain. And so I think he needs to be very careful about how they go in, so that it's it's much more thoughtful, much more methodical about what they're doing. They have in mind the public relations aspect of this, so they're selling it in the right way rather than just going in with a bulldozer. Uh, I, I don't think that that is saleable from a marketing standpoint. I've seen this before, you know, when the government, you know, they have these budget crises here in Washington and, um, you know, Newt Gingrich shut down the government. Well, the first thing did, the Clinton administration did was chain the doors on the Smithsonian and the uh, Washington Monument. So that's the kind of public relations you don't want. But that's the kind of public relations that you'll probably have to anticipate trying to find a way to to overcome. Yeah, that's heartening, isn't it? <laughs> it, it it's a little bit. I uh, it's like I, it's like, yes, I, I wanted to succeed. But yeah, like for me, from my standpoint, if we start cutting like, you know, if I can't go to the things or they start closing libraries and things of that nature, then I'm going to feel that I'm going to sort of begin to notice that stuff. And, and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to have a lot of regret of how I voted for this. Right. So, um, I think it, it needs to be done. Like you say, um, methodically and with thought and my misgivings with it. Uh, and I, I wanted, want them for sure to su- succeed, but it's the time. Like, do they have enough time to accomplish what, they're setting out to do. And I, what I heard, and I could be wrong, that they have until 2026 to sort of dismantle a, a lot of this pork spending and a lot of this extra things, you know, from the budget, but is the time, like, do we have enough time? Yes. I, I would say yes. In fact, Interesting. you know, I, I, I could probably um, pull together, you know, a, a small or pretty good sized team of experts very quickly to pull off something like this and put together a spending plan that, that, that could achieve much of their goals. And in fact, it's kind of interesting. There's a, a foundation here in Washington called the Peterson Foundation. It was set up by this uh, billionaire who was very worried about the deficit. And he had, they had just a, sort of a competition earlier this year asking a number of think tanks to put together deficit reduction plans. So there are already these kind of ideas out there that are on the shelf that have been vetted by experts. We may not all agree about some of these things, but they're there and they could be used as a resource for Musk and Wamaswamy to draw from as they're looking for ideas. So there's no lack of talent here in Washington and elsewhere. People who have done this exercise in the past, like myself, um, who could certainly aid in it. Uh, so they wouldn't have to start from scratch. President-elect Trump said that he wanted to cut the Department of Education. And the Department of Education, I believe, was implemented in like 1979 or 1980. So it's like, you know, fairly recent in the history of the U.S. But the Department of Education doesn't actually really have a massive budget because 90% of funding for the K through 12 public schools is, is through local state, you know, it's just why you, you pay property taxes, et cetera. But the one big thing that they do is that the department of education oversees about $1.6 trillion 
for the federal student loan program. And then it also sets the rules for how colleges receive this funding. And that would completely overhaul the whole college education system. And then that leads us to another you know, question like, maybe people don't need to go to school for X number of years. I mean, it's essentially almost like indentured servitude. I mean, you go to school for 10 years for some jobs. I mean, I remember back in the day, like I have a a degree in health and human performance. And when I was graduating, a lot of the physical therapists, for instance, only had a bachelor's degree. And then when I was going to university, you had to have a master's degree, but they were transitioning to where you had to have the doctorate of physical therapy. So it's like, well, you might as well just get the, the DBT because the time you graduate, they're probably going to have these requirements. I know like, you know, I have a ex-girlfriend that's a respiratory therapist. She's, she had a two-year associate degree. Now, a lot of places now you have to have a four-year uh, degree to do the same job. And it's like, you know, you're having all these people go to school way too long, take out way too much debt just so they can get some credential and feel good about themselves. And so if, if they did mess with this $1.6 trillion, wouldn't there be a massive effect of like these universities would have to cut their, I guess the cost if, if they're not able to get trillions of dollars? Well, it's interesting, Jesse, the more that we have tried, we, the more that government has tried to make college more affordable, the less affordable it has become, the more expensive it's become, and the more gold-plated many of these universities has become. So what the universities are very good at is understanding where the gravy train is coming from in Washington, whether it's tax credits for the students or their parents, uh, whether it's all these loans and, and government subsidies, they're able to take those and build those subsidies into the price of tuition, and it keeps going up and up and up the more we try to make it more affordable. So getting these universities off the gravy train is the first step toward making college more affordable and making it a true marketplace in which these universities are competing for students. Now they can be selective they're what's called in economics price takers. So they can decide who they want to be um, uh, uh, students. I mean, imagine going to Best Buy and say, I want to buy a television set. And the guy selling the television set knows your income, knows your parents' income, the value of their home, uh, any loans uh, that you might be able to, to, to tap, uh, whether or not you have coupons. It doesn't put you in a very good position to bargain, does it? Well, that's what these guys have got. And, and so uh, we've got to turn this into a true marketplace if we're going to start reducing the, the, the cost of, of universities and making them focus on the kinds of degrees that actually people can make it, you know, a, a living on. Um, the other thing is when it comes to lower education or elementary and secondary, Again, the government's basically a laundromat, so it's taking all this money from taxpayers and then sending it back to the states and, and local governments. Why? Why do we have to do this? Let's keep it there at the state level, the local level, so that it's being used more efficiently. As far as all those loans that have already been given out, we should sell those into the secondary market, basically securitize them, and have somebody else manage those loans and, re and not forgive them as we have the Biden administration has forgiven all those loans. All you're doing is selling, is sending a signal to people like myself and others that have paid back their loans. Hey, you guys were chumps. Yep. <laughs> Stupid <laughs> were you, you know? And yep. I, what, what kind I, of a message is that? Yeah. Oh, I was responsible. Man, am I stupid? <laughs> I should have waited around, you know? I've never heard that idea before. I, I guess uh, maybe I'm under a rock, but that's a great idea. Like have the colleges compete, create a, a good product uh, to compete for the business of the students that want to go there. Um, and that's going to make them better schools. And they're not going to have, you know, useless, you know, degrees that nobody cares or nobody will succeed in, um, in the, out in the real world. Have them compete for the business of the students that want this education and, and create that, that marketplace. Like, 
I like this idea very much. I'm a huge fan of Marketplace. How can they go about doing that, like doing that kind of education reform to make it so that it's up to us, like where we want to spend our money, what school we want to go to, because it, it, it's the quality. We're, we're choosing quality over just sort of the name and then have the colleges choosing us as students. You know, the students now have the sort of upper hand. Like, how, how can we get there? Well, again, getting back to the marketplace and getting government out of subsidizing these various industries. You know, it's interesting that if you look at the three most expensive or or out of reach areas that most families suffer from are basically housing, education and health care. And those are the three sectors in the economy that are most subsidized by the federal government. So we need, to, we need to break those markets free from government subsidies in order to make them markets again so that they are competing and driving down the costs. You know, there are various groups that put out these interesting graphs showing the rising costs of health care and education and housing relative to things like computers, in which the price has gone down over the last 40 years. And so computers are very affordable these days. Other things like like electronics are very affordable these days. Why? Because the marketplace is driving down costs. And if you have areas like housing in which you have things like uh, mortgage interest deduction and other things which get built into the price of homes, you know, that actually increases the price, makes it less affordable. All these education subsidies makes college less affordable. All the health care subsidies makes healthcare less affordable and less of a marketplace. So we've got to detach these these industries from government to bring the marketplace back in, in play so that it can help drive down costs and increase uh, quality as we do in every other aspect of our lives. Gotcha. Now you have to just market that idea to the people so they're not so sour about like, right. you know, because the moment someone here, oh, they're going to detach the government and the subsidies to education, you know, the opposition will just say, oh, look, they want to defund education and they'll label it as such, even though um, deep inside it's, it's actually bettering the system. Um, it's like now it's like now we have to come up with a way. I see that we have to market this to the people that it's actually going to help you because of this. What if this is a complete aside, Kai? But um, back when they were creating the Department of Education uh, in the 1970s, one clever staffer, a member, uh, he was a staff member for one of the senators, um, wrote this little amendment. Then he rushed down, he put this on the floor, and it was going to label it the Department of Public Education, D O P E. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> and the last, at the last minute, someone else realized what was going on, and they rushed down to try to squash uh, that amendment. But I, I think that was probably the most fitting thing. That <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just a perception. And, um, uh, you know, it's easy to deceive the public. It, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I hope they succeed. I, I really do. Um. And, and, you know, to have the people behind it, to be able to explain some of these better ideas. But we, we need new ideas to kind of make this happen. And uh, anyways, I don't know. But, you know, but you're on to something here where, you know, language, marketing, uh, optics are a big part of this. Yeah. And the, 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 the defenders of these programs are going to say, oh, you're cutting education. Yep. Poor That's exactly kids, what they're going to do. Yeah, poor kids won't be educated anymore, yep. and they'll come up with sob stories. Yep. And, you know, I remember years ago, back in um, in the 90s, when Republicans had taken over the House, they were holding lots of hearings on downsizing government. And I was called in as a, a expert to, to testify, and one of them was in front of the Labor and HHS subcommittee. And so I was talking about how to reduce spending in those agencies and advocates there was a about 20 kids in wheelchairs at the back of the hearing room as a backdrop 
to my testimony, they know how to play the game. Optics and, and, and messaging is really important. And so you've got to think about how to counter that uh, as, as we go forward and try to downsize government. And, and so that's going to be a big test uh, for, for uh, Musk and Ramaswamy because those guys are more likely to go in with a sink and a hammer and try to just crush the place and not think about the optics of this and the public relations aspect. And as a result, they can get trounced because of it. Well, I think Ramaswamy is really articulate. I kind of, I kind of feel that he has that a way to do this, to explain it to the people and why this works and why the other way doesn't work. It's going to be critically important yeah. to message this in the right way, especially with the things like education and elsewhere, that people just sort of, people weren't really tuning in and saying, oh, they're cutting in education. And so they're going to have to find ways to message this in, in a way that sounds like it's responsible and meaningful. Cutting the bureaucracy, now that plays. If you say, no, we're just cutting the bureaucracy and we're cutting the waste, that's a whole different thing. Let's try to get to some like brass tacks here, so to speak. I mean, as we've kind of started this podcast, basically somewhere around like 85 cents per dollar, go to Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, defense, yep. some of the other like VA programs and uh, benefits for other federal employees, um, you know, food stamps, et cetera, and then interest on the debt. That's somewhere around 85 cents. You know, like even like the Department of Education we were talking about is like less than $250 billion. It's like pennies compared to you know, Department of Trans DOT is like less than 2% of the the budget and you you'll hear like some of the senators talk about like you have these rabbits that are doped up on cocaine or something yet science and medical research is one percent of the budget so like yeah right. that, those studies do happen but they're not really like that that prevalent. i mean the big thing we, we talked about was social security medicaid medicare uh, interest in the debt and the and the def and the defense budget so of these 85 cents I mean, how much of that, because that's really where you're going to have the savings, right, is the 85 cents on the dollar. So, I mean, what, realistically, what can we, and, the, you know, if, if we got a $36 trillion deficit, are we going to go back to the Clinton days and get to a balanced budget, or is that not going to happen? Well, I, I mean, yes, let's go after the 15 cents uh, and, and pare that down dramatically. But that doesn't mean that we can't look at the other areas of the budget that are some of the more lightning rod, uh, you know, areas. Look, for instance, I was just looking on, there's a government website, uh, I think it's called ac accountability.org or something like that. And they list all what the, what's called uh, the improper payments for government programs. This is uh, sort of the waste, fraud and abuse kind of stuff where, you know, they pay doctors uh, for Medicare payments that they didn't perform and things like that. And it's, well over $200 billion a year in these kind of improper payments. And so just cutting back on some of those things uh, could help a long way towards, you know, trimming the size of the debt and the deficit. And that's just getting rid of pure waste. I mean, honestly, or in some cases it is fraud. Um, the earned income tax credit, for instance, is notorious for the last 20 years. Um, it's the amount of improper payments is about 25%. Essentially, one out of every $4 the program spends is wasted. And so you got these kind of programs, so tighten those up, find ways to go after that kind of stuff. That's, that, that's meaningful, and it's not trivial. It's, a, it's, you know, when we're looking at $200 billion a year, that's $2 trillion over a decade that you can save if you're able to rein that in. We're talking about the, the federal government right now, but, but what about the state level of bureaucracy? San Francisco alone, you know, a city that spends over a billion dollars a year just on homelessness, or at least, you know, I spend over a billion dollars a year recently just, just yeah. on homelessness. And, you know, and we were discussing Elon Musk, but you have the California Coastal Commission, which basically denied SpaceX these permits to do some extra extra launches, whatever. Even though the I think I believe it was the U.S. Space Force put in the the permit application, and essentially, 
they were denied. Elon Musk and SpaceX was denied because they were voted down by the commissioners and a couple of the, the commissioners on this panel basically cited Elon Musk political views, which I'm not sure what that has to do with launching these rockets for national security and and NASA space, you know, Space Force, et cetera. But what about the bureaucracy at the state level? I mean, this whole California Coastal Commission was started in the 1970s to preserve the California coast. How the hell are they in 2024 in charge of these launch sites? And then you get these, I mean, like, and then like the women on there were like talking about his tweets and stuff. It's right. like, what, what the hell does that have to do with, with him launching rockets? And how do you have the power to deny him and then of course they're being sued as they should but then who who is who is going to be defending the california coastal commission it's going to be attorneys paid for by taxpayers of california right like so there goes more of the bureaucracy and waste of waste of money right and then all those people on the commission are making like six figures yep yep yeah and, and you know things like the clean air act which has given california the uh ability to basically change the entire nature of automobile industry in America, just because they can set you know their own standards and they're such a big marketplace, that ought to go. I'm sorry. Amen. You, you shouldn't. Have, you know, it, California shouldn't have that much power. And one of the ways you can deal with that, Jesse, again, is the same way that you deal with it with uh, the universities and so forth. You cut them off. The government, the federal government, gives out hundreds of billions of dollars in grants to state and local governments for what? So that they can fund those kinds of programs. Programs. Okay, if you want to do it, fund it on your own dime. Don't do it on Uncle Sam's dime. So that's another area that you could start cutting back. And yes, you're going to hear a lot of squawking, but there are programs <laughs> that make these, you know, whether it's community development block grants, the Appalachian Regional Commission, there's all kinds of these programs out there that were created during various do-gooder eras in America, and all they do is fund bureaucrats and these do-gooder programs. Cut them off. Let them, if, if it's so important, then you fund it at the local level, you tax your people to do it, but don't do it at federal taxpayers' dime. And so that's another area you can start cutting back easily. And yes, you're going to hear squawking, but that's fine. Let, let them squawk. Let them squawk. <laughs> let them squawk. We, we ought to make a new rap song. Cut them off. <laughs> squawk, squawk, squawk. <laughs> we'll invite you to be on the, uh, on the, uh, the music video. We'll write, a new, we'll write a new song. This is a new era. Like, like we, we have to cut them off. I, I mean, uh, gee whiz. I'm, I'm excited and nervous at the same time. Um, but, uh, curious to know, where do you think in your sort of research and findings that we have inefficiencies in our defense budget? Now I'm, I'm hearing that we need to increase the, our defense budget to sort of catch up, you know, with the China's and the Russia's out there. So that's one question. And the other question is what about energy? Do we increase our budget with nuclear energy infrastructure, that kind of thing? Like, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, defense is a real uh, challenging issue because obviously in s the world's getting more dangerous. We need to be prepared for that. But are there areas for efficiency? Yes, absolutely. You know, for instance, the Department of Defense owns various golf courses. That, Get out. Uh, I mean, really. If they that, don't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. That must uh, cost millions a year. Yes. Yeah. Also that, you know, uh, the generals and whatnot can play golf. Really? You know, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. There's probably, um, you know, there's there's ongoing efforts to close unnecessary military bases and do a consolidation there. You know, the amount of waste that goes into some of these defense contracts, that is abhorrent, uh, where, you know, these defense contractors are making off like bandits and, and are not efficient nor responsible. So there's a lot that can be done there. On the energy front, well, of course, government's sitting on a lot of areas that um, we could do more energy exploration um, and, and drilling and whatnot that they have essentially closed off to doing so. And I think we need to get back to the point in which the United States is an exporter 
of right. energy rather than an importer. But here's the, getting back to a mis a, a misnamed agency is the Department of Energy. Okay. It doesn't produce a kilowatt of energy. All it does is subsidize, you know, companies like Solyndra and some of these these other uh, firms that are, you know, living on government handouts. Get out. A lot, a lot of what the a lot of what the Department of Energy does is manage the old nuclear waste facilities that the government had uh, over the over the decades as part of the war effort, the government labs. Um, so it could go away tomorrow and we would probably be better off in terms of having more energy. So we uh, can cut the them out. They got to go. Cut them out. Squawk, squawk, squawk. That's right. <laughs> Let's you cut them out know. and let's build a new department that actually produces energy. That's where we have to be. I, I feel like our country is going to be incredibly rich if we produce our energy and, and, and sell it. Yep. Yep. We have, look, you know, the, the Saudis and the Russians and everybody else would be, um, we could put them out of business. Let's go. Uh, if we do it right. And, you know, one of the one of the, the saddest things is that we didn't realize this early on when it came to things like natural gas. And we should have been selling natural gas to Europe. So they weren't relying on Russia, which put them in a, a hardball spot when the Ukraine war started. So, you know, there are a lot of global aspects of this as well, not just the the sort of energy market aspect of it is, which is obviously critically important. How did like these NGOs factor into this? Because, you know, an NGO is a non-government ent entity or yep. you know, a non-government uh, organization, right? I guess I replaced the E with an O, but uh, you know what I'm saying here, the NGO, yep. right? But essentially, these are just kind of de, de facto, they're just subsidiaries of the government, right? I mean, that's all they are. Like you basically had in the, was it the 1970s or whatever, the CIA was like funding various things, uh, various organizations through like the Ford Foundation. And then it was super easy for people to find out where the money was going from the CIA to the Ford, you know, to the CIA gives money to the Ford Foundation and they give money and then people are like, oh yeah, this is what the CIA is funding. So then they've basically figured out like, hey, you have to have, you have to like have a bunch of, tax havens and all like they they use all these these tax shelters so people don't know what they're funding but essentially a lot of these ngos are just you know the quote-unquote deep state funding themselves right like they're not really you know people just doing like good good work to have some activist cause or whatever so how, how does like the ngos factor into to all this and how we we break up. I mean, I think Kai talked earlier about the nonprofit sector and those NGOs kind of fall into that category, right? Yeah, that's that's the really a real deep state. And to be honest with you, we do not have a good accounting of the vast number of these nonprofits and NGOs that are almost completely reliant on federal government funding. Now, there are some that are somewhat related to the defense industry. Uh, the MITRE Corporation, the RAND Corporation, and others that were kind of spun out of, 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 of the government at, at, during the 50s and 60s. And those are almost reliant, uh, entirely reliant on government contracts. Some of these are multi-billion dollar a year organizations that are considered nonprofits. I mean, come on, really? Um, and and though that's got to go. But then you've got all these smaller groups that are being funded by government you know, through like Department of Energy subsidies because of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and then you've got uh, hundreds of thousands of other small entities that um, do everything from, you know, you know, run uh, public housing to women's shelters and whatnot. And we really don't have a good accounting of the vast amount of, of, of these organizations that are almost truly reliant on federal funding. And we need to get our arms around that because that is the true deep state. That's sort of the shadow government out there. And we really don't have a good understanding of how much largesse is going in their direction. Why don't we have mandates for them to produce the proper accounting for where they're spending the money? Why, why don't we have like basically it's like, hey, you're going to prove where you spend the money or you're gone. Yeah, it's, uh, like we let them get it, away with this. I mean, even even the you know the the triple letter you know the CIA uh, they can't 
they can't produce accounting where they're spending billions of dollars. Like, can't we cut, you know, is why can't they make them? Well, how did they get away with it? I guess I'll just simplify this. How did they get away with that? Yeah, because the spending is so diffuse, spread across we were talking at the beginning about how many hundreds of agencies there are. And this this funding is spread across those in so many different directions, it's hard to get our arms around whatever the true amount is. And that's part of the problem. So even if you were to dig down deep into the Department of Energy's budget, it's really hard to find where some of this funding is going because it's at the micro level. And we do need to shine a light on this kind of spending. And it's very, very difficult because it gets buried way down deep into these multi-billion dollar agency budgets. How many federal employees are there? You Google the stat and the number is like a few million, but the vast majority are actually the kind of independent contractors. So the number is actually like skewed, right? Isn't it between, I mean, according to David Friedberg on Owen Podcast, something around 50% of all employees in the U.S. are government employees, whether that's federal, state, or local level. Now we're talking, I guess, more about the federal bureaucracy, but he's saying he's putting it at some somewhere around half, at least in terms of GDP. What do you think the actual, do we even, I mean, first off, do we even know this, the way that they classify them? And secondly, yeah. what's what's the number that we, we have? Yeah, we have a pretty good idea that the number of, uh, of federal uh, civilian employees, non-military, is around what 2.3 to, to, to 2.8 million, um, and you know some of those. I uh, don't remember if that includes the post office or not. That might, um, and, and and so that that's a lot certainly. And then you of course, as you mentioned, you have the contractors in there, and I don't have a good handle on how many of that, uh, how many contractors are above and beyond the 2.3 million. I'm sure it's a lot. In terms of, we do have a good handle, though, on the total amount of all government workers. Uh, I think it's around 24 million uh, if you add up state, local, federal. Uh, most of those are state and local, uh, frankly, in terms of government workers. You have tens of thousands of, of gov government agencies across the states, and uh, it's a lot of people. But it, it's still a fairly small percentage of the overall amount of our, our federal our our national workforce, which is 10 times as big. What's like uh, an ideal number, you think? Well, again, it gets back to the question of not how government should operate, but what it should do. And we need to have a reconciliation for what each level of government's responsibility should be. And we haven't done that. Uh, in fact, over the years, the federal government has taken on more and more responsibilities that are really left to the state and local government level and shouldn't be, you know, basically run out of a Washington bureaucracy. And so we need to have that kind of reconciliation. And we probably have, should have the same reconciliation in every state. Although, quite honestly, every state runs things a little bit differently. And that's probably good because then you have sort of a uh, marketplace at work as age as governments figure out what's the best thing to do at, at their level. So some some governments um, are, are pretty lean and mean at the state level and others are like New York and California are, are, are much bigger and fatter and uh, probably look much more like the federal government. Um, and and that, that kind of competition is good though. You know, frankly, which state do you think you feel is doing it right the Not, most? Well, um, the tax foundation does, at least on the tax level, um, we do an annual uh, index of state tax systems to look at the ones that are most competitive, most friendly to business, uh, most efficient, if you will, uh, or at least least harmful. And states like uh, Wyoming and Montana and, and Nevada and States that don't have an income tax tend to float toward the top. Um, there are other states that do very well, too, like Indiana, for instance, ranks in the top 10 in terms of the quality of its tax system because it doesn't do anything to excess. You know, all of its tax rates are rather modest, moderate. They're rather equal across all the uh, tax bases. So uh, that's a good thing. And so we like to see a lot of that competition 
uh, uh, at the state level because it forces states to be responsible. Yes, and you know, you're going to have states like New York that are never responsible, but they're going to pay the price as people move out. And California has seen that today, where people are moving out, like you know, like Elon Musk and others. The rich people are saying, "I've I've had it. You know, stop taxing me this way." And they're finally moving out. Kind of the last question I asked you about, you know, how many total employees, and we've discussed this, you know, previous on this podcast, which is with these NGOs, but for example, like in San Francisco, where they have this massive homeless industrial complex, you mentioned just the city of San Francisco spends over a billion dollars a year, but that city is actually hiring out, quote unquote, nonprofits or charities right. to do the work. Yeah. So th they are de facto, no accountability. Right, right. Sorry. So they have no accountability there, but there are, they are de facto employees of the government, right? Like they, yeah. they don't even, and then you could do the same thing in New York city. And that's just one example. What about all the, the quote unquote climate change, you know, these people putting up, you know, windmills or whatever. I mean, they're all with all fr uh, subsidies from the government. They all are essentially part of the, government bureaucracy, but they're not really showing up in, in those numbers, right? I mean, how many people are in the solar industry or the wind industry or in the homeless industrial complex industry or like, you know, San Francisco, how many people are walking around giving out needles or, yep. or you know, or, or whatever, right? I mean, the, these are all people part of this. I mean, like those numbers are vastly underrated or I shouldn't say underrated, but they're under represent yeah. under undercounted. Repre yeah, undercounted sure. yeah. Yeah. That's why they no, got to yeah. go. Squawk, squawk, squawk. <laughs> on the other hand yes they're going to squawk pretty loudly once you start yep. cutting their budgets and you do realize how much of the economy is built around this government largesse and jesse you're absolutely right especially at the local level we're seeing more and more local governments contract out with nonprofits and ngos because oh to contract out with the private sector would be you know, they would have conflicts of interest or we, we don't want to, you know, support, you know, those those greedy businesses. So we're going to contract out with these inefficient nonprofits instead. Um, and that, that's a real problem. Yeah, especially Jeez. when you when you factor in that, it's like you you have your cousin start the nonprofit as your like deputy mayor or something and then funnel the money to, you know, no, no conflict of interest here. Right. Yeah. No conflict of interest there. They have mansions. <laughs> Um, what's, I guess, uh, I, I, I just out of curiosity, what's it like working with, uh, president Donald Trump? Is he, uh, you know, is, is he open to hearing the, these new ideas? Like, is he, is he interested in, in sort of like, you know, uh, do, do you think he'd be interested in hearing these, these ideas that you have? Well, I, I don't have any personal, um, uh, um, anecdotes about working directly with him, but, you know, I, I think one of the challenges with Trump is that he's often uh, influenced by the last person to talk to him. And so, you know, he needs to be surrounded by responsible people. And, you know, it's one thing to be surrounded by bomb throwers and people who really, you know, are just we're going to, you know, we're just going to, you know, sweep out the, the, the swamp and whatnot. But you have to do these things in, in tactical ways. And um, I think that caution has to be part of that and think strategically rather than just going in with a bulldozer and mowing it down. Um, so I kind of worry sometimes that, you know, he'll go with his gut feelings and, and not think as much strategically as, as you kind of need. Because remember, everything they want to do or much of it needs to go through Congress eventually. And that's where the big challenge is. And will Congress feel the same sense of urgency uh, as part of that mandate? And that's, I, I don't know the question. We don't that know right that. Yeah, we don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that he's selecting a good cabinet thus far? I mean, you know, as they're uh, announcing it, sort of. Yeah, you it's know. been kind of a mix. Uh, you see, it's been a mix and uh, you do have some very good people in there, um, whether it's Marco Rubio or Berg, Bergstrom or Bergram or uh, some of the others. But then, you know, the RFK thing baffles me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the, the issue there is or the Matt Gates thing. I mean, really? Um, 
So I it's gonna you know, be I, a mix, yeah. Yeah, I just think that some of these are kind of cringe worthy, honestly. Interesting. Yeah. I guess I I don't know much about it. Sort of I'm sort of like just trying to get the feelers and, and for me to know the, the only way I'll know is when I see it in action. Like um uh but it but it's uh but like I said, I, I think the the one takeaway for me, the best takeaway that, that you've said in this podcast, one of the best ones is like if if they were to sort of really explain this to the American people and why they're doing what they're doing and how they're doing it and why that's important or why that works. Um, that, that's what I want to know. That's what most of us know and want to know. It's like, why are you doing that versus, you know, if you did it another way, how is that not going to work? So, so really explain it and make us understand, uh, their moves, their chess moves, if you will. Um, that's sort of what I, what I want to know. So, I, I mean, I'm hopeful, I'm somewhat nervous. Um, but in general, I, um, I, I hope, I, I hope that they, it, they succeed and and sort of shrinking the government down because I, I I think we're just a little bit too bloated, um, but yeah, your instincts are right. And you know, one of the wor my worries is that look, we've had an administration for the last four years that it basically run things through slogans and bumper stickers. You know, mm -hmm. worker centered this and that. You know, what have you? That didn't work. To replace those people with folks from the right who have the same, a different set of slogans and messaging, that doesn't work either. If you're going to be able to effectively reduce the size of government, you got to know something about the agency and what you're downsizing. And so I worry when you're putting people who are sloganeers, <laughs> or basically polemics, that they're just not going to know enough in order to to adequately tear down an agency in a way that makes sense not just become a bull in a china shop so scott hodge to kind of last big big question here since we're talking about the doge the department of government efficiency but <laughs> president richard nixon he set out when he was president he wanted to make the government kind of smaller and cheaper is what he wanted to do. And of course, Richard Nixon created the EPA. He created OSHA. He created the NOAA or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He created the DEA or the Drug, the Drug Enforcement Administration. So he set out to drain the swamp as a lot of a lot of these people say, including Nixon with the Grace Commission and now Trump. But instead of Instead of uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon draining the uh, draining the swamp, they drained him, and you know he ended up <laughs> getting impeached over uh, Watergate. But do you think we'll actually see any draining of the swamp under this Trump administration? It seems like we've had a lot of presidents want to do this, and I do think they had good intentions. But like especially like Nixon, I mean, he was almost like FDR. I mean, he really expanded the scope and the powers of the federal government. So yeah, he certainly did. And he, and he yeah. essentially was trying to buy an election. He also, uh, in months before the, the election in what, 74, um, he increased social security benefits, <laughs> which hmm. compounded social security's rather fragile financing. Um, so yeah, you have to be very, very careful about um, rhetoric versus pandering because, you know, as we've seen with Trump, you know, he has a tendency to pander, whether it's, you know, trying to cut taxes on tips or overtime or Social Security or other things. You know, is he going to pander and get himself into a position where he's supporting expanding government uh, or these various tax breaks in the code that don't make any sense and actually make the situation worse? Yeah. So we have to be very, very cautious about that. And that's why there has to be an adult in the room to say, no, these things are irresponsible. Let's not do them. And if we go back to his first presidency, didn't he, he expanded the, I mean, at least the federal government, I think he added something like $2 trillion to the, to the deficit. Wasn't it something like that? Yeah. And, you know, some of that was with the tax cuts that was planned for. I mean, they went into the tax cuts in 2017 with the idea that we're going to have a trillion and a half dollars with the tax cuts over the next decade. So they at least went into that wi eyes wide open. 
On the other hand, it's easy to get caught up in spending more money uh, with, uh, without that level of forethought or understanding, and that's where you really get into trouble. And right now, the problem is not the lack of tax revenues. It is spending. And so we're, they're going to have to be really vigilant on trying to cut back spending. Getting back to our, our, our Doge conversation, I hope this is successful. Uh, and I hope that Congress takes it seriously and implements these policies in a way that are going to be effective uh, and that last over time and aren't eroded by some future president in Congress uh, that puts it all back into place. Yeah. It feels like that, though. You know, they'll build something, the next one turns it, turns, you know, uh, tears it down. They build something yeah. again, tears it down. It's sort of like, I think, uh, yeah, we need, we, need, we need time, you know. We sort of need time to, to reset it. But um, I like what you said there. I, I'm hopeful. I, I hope they succeed. And, and I hope Musk and Vivek are, are the right people for the job and, and the team that they're going to build. I find it interesting that if you look at the governments that spend the most money per capita, Luxembourg is number one, which makes sense. It's mm. the richest country in the world. Two is Norway. Three is Iceland. Four is Denmark. And then fifth is the United States, followed by Switzerland, Austria, Finland, Belgium, and Australia for the top 10. But the ones all ahead of us, they're all known for massive social programs. You know, I mentioned the first podcast, how I was in, lived in Luxembourg for a while, where you have free subways, you have like two years maternity leave and free health care and free daycare. And they give you like 25 euros a day to eat and all this stuff. Like what is the United States getting, you know, for being number, number five, I guess we do, you know, kind of provide the military for the world, which is a, an expense and the national, the interest in the national debt and the military is like 20% of the, the budget alone. Right. But like, I mean, how, how do these other countries like Luxembourg, Norway, Iceland, Denmark ahead of us, how do they, manage to provide all these programs uh and we can't with and we have a 35 trillion dollar or 36 trillion dollar deficit that's a great question. well they do uh they do things a little bit differently they have for instance a value added tax which we don't and so that can often add about um you know uh an extra 20 percent to their budget and that funds a lot of their social welfare programs is through that broad-based value-added tax, which is like a national sales tax that hits everybody, and they're willing to do that. And we, we've chosen to borrow our way to, to, to fund our social welfare system rather than tax our way into it. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things. The other thing is that you know most people don't know how much government they're getting or not getting, and they have a, a real distorted view of that. Um, and, you know, when you have a $2 trillion uh, uh, deficit, that means that uh, the, we have this thing called fiscal illusion where we think government costs us this much, but it, we're actually getting this much. <clears throat> and that's because we're borrowing against the future in order to pay for it. And, um, you know, that, that creates some problems as well because people think they're getting more government than they're really paying for. Uh, we need to kind of square that circle so that you people do have a better sense of how much government that that they're spending on and try to to reconcile that with with how much they're actually paying i mean we're getting more government than we're paying for essentially but we're we're doing it on the backs of our kids who are going to pay higher taxes in order to fund this two trillion dollars a year in extra spending that we're doing so, Scott, and I appreciate you taking the time. I think we ran a little bit over. We're at an hour and 20 minutes here, so we'll wrap this up so you can actually be productive today and do some more <laughs> important things than hanging out with Kai and Jesse. But so today, Oh, man, we'll take you for another couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> so today's no, guest. This, this is fun. I, I really enjoy this, and it's, it's a great topic, and I'm glad you guys have tackled it. And Fabulous questions, flab fabulous discussion. So I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be on the show. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Scott Hodge, who, of course, is the president emeritus and senior policy advisor at the Tax Foundation. So, Scott, two final questions for your work. And people find you get a hold of your research and some of your your editorials, things like that. And then secondly, just leave us with a final thought related to the Doge department or whatever is on your mind. Yeah, I, I encourage everyone to come to the Tax Foundation's website, by the way. 
Tax Foundation has a wealth of information on our, our website at taxfoundation.org.org. It's all free, it's all publicly available, and, and it's very accessible. Yeah, so you can really educate yourself. We have this great uh, interactive uh, area of our website. It's called Tax EDU. It's our tax literacy program as we try to give people the tools so they can raise their own sort of tax IQ and that way they won't be bamboozled by uh, politicians uh, trying to sell them things. And so I encourage everybody to come to, to the Tax Foundation's website. And again, getting back to Doge, let's just cross our fingers that um, uh, both uh, Musk and Ramaswamy take this seriously, draw upon the resources of folks like myself and others here in Washington who have studied these issues and, and don't feel like they need to start from scratch because there's a great wealth of information and, and expertise out here that can help them as they go about trying to put together a menu of options to downsize the government. It's long, long overdue. Uh, this, has been, this has been generations in the making, so it's going to take time to kind of break it all down again, but it's something that has to be done. We simply can't afford the government we have. And five years from now, will Doge more, be more about headlines or will it be more about change? What do you think when we're just, you know, when we have you back on in 2028, what, what are we going to be yeah. discussing? If past is prologue, unfortunately, they may have yet another 300 page, you know, report sitting on a dusty shelf. But let's hope not. I hope let's not. Let's hope they yeah. just take it seriously. My dear friends, that is it for this episode of El Podcast. Once again, if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube as well as Rumble. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for watching and listening, and we will see you on the next episode.